Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, more despair for Afghanistan. Suicide bombers strike an already chaotic and vulnerable Kabul, killing dozens. We will hunt you down and make you pay. The bitter sadness of those who say Canada failed them. My soul, I'm not the same person. Also tonight, as the federal campaign heats up, Quebec's premier flexes. They don't want to be in a fight with the popular premier. Rosemary and that issue have all the election politics. The pressure mounts in Ontario for a vaccine passport. We have to protect not only ourselves, but all those people around us. And for their family, the pandemic brought a birth and a death. Never got to uh, be held by him. Joy and loss in a reunion delayed. This is The National. Death and destruction hit hard in Kabul's crowded streets, as if the people of Afghanistan haven't endured enough. But for a country already reeling, a city already in turmoil, today an exclamation point of chaos. Two suicide bombers and a number of gunmen attacked crowds outside the airport. At least 60 Afghans are dead, along with at least 13 American service members. U.S. officials say they believe an ISIS-affiliated group in Afghanistan is responsible. So let's take a closer look at that area outside the airport in Kabul, where for days thousands have been hoping to get on flights out of the country. One explosion happened here at the Abbey Gate. It's a main entrance to the airport. Many people have been told to go there. The other blast occurred less than two kilometers away at the Baron Hotel. That is where others looking to leave were having their cases processed. Now, the impacts will be felt in the streets of Kabul and around the world. Carolyn Dunn begins our coverage tonight with what we know about the attack and a promise from the U.S. that those behind it will pay. The casualty count among Afghans mounts by the hour. Hundreds dead and injured in an attack international forces had warned was imminent. The suicide bombers, believed to be blending in with the crowds of those trying to get into the airport. After the two deadly explosions, a hail of gunfire for maximum damage. It was a powerful suicide attack, this witness says. Many were killed, including Americans. Along with U.S. soldiers who are dead, more than a dozen injured. We will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. U.S. President Joe Biden vowed there will be a response. I've also ordered my commanders to develop operational plans to strike ISIS-K assets, leadership, and facilities. This attack is one too many. But the Pentagon revealed there are still credible threats of more attacks from ISIS. So the U.S. is taking the enemy of my enemy is my friend approach, sharing limited intelligence with the Taliban. We share versions of this information with the Taliban so that they can actually do some searching out there for us, and we believe that some attacks have been thwarted by them. For now, the Taliban, an avowed enemy of ISIS, has similar goals. Targeting innocent uh, civilians is an act of terrorism. As soon as uh, the airport situation is figured out and the foreign forces leave, hopefully we will not have such attacks anymore. Playing nice with the Taliban does have conditions. NATO allies continue to demand they commit to giving safe passage to anyone who wishes to leave, even after the U.S. evacuation mission officially ends. Okay, so Carolyn, is there any indication when we can expect that promised response from the U.S.? Well, Andrew, Biden said the response would happen, quote, at the place we choose and at the moment of our choosing. He also said if that meant mobilizing more troops for that response, he's going to do whatever it takes. That, of course, as the U.S. continues to stick stubbornly to its deadline of being out of Afghanistan by next Tuesday. Carolyn Dunn, thank you very much. Thank you. For more on this, I spoke not long ago with Matthew Akins from the New York Times. He's from Halifax but lives in Kabul right now and says he heard a telltale popping sound and knew it meant an explosion. So he got on a motorcycle and went to the airport. I caught up with him on a slightly unstable line in a deeply unstable place. It's a terrible thing to come across, and, I, and I'm wondering what struck you about it when you were there. 
Well, it's, it's just such a terrible place for something like this to happen because people were packed in like sardines. You know, they were cramming up to these gates, trying to get to soldiers, desperately show them some scrap of paper, their documents, their passports in the in the hopes of being let into the airport so they could be evacuated. So you imagine throwing a suicide blast in that mix, you're going to have a devastating number of casualties, which is what's happened today. Who is there to help people sort of medically and in that moment? Are there any foreign military on, on the ground still who, who are making themselves known at all? There's no foreign military outside the airport, but there is a, an NGO called Emergency, which provides free medical care. They're, they have a trauma hospital in Kabul, and that's where I went through the explosion and they were bringing in just ambulance after ambulance of uh, full of casualties, some of them little children. Uh, they, they were coming in the eyes of a very anxious crowd, relatives weeping on the sidelines. And have you seen or encountered any Canadians or any anyone with Canadian documentation or any status in Canada has just in the course of your reporting? I know I have friends who work for Canadian media organizations who are promised visas to Canada and who haven't made it out because the evacuation has been such a shambles and because it was so last minute. And, you know, I should I want to add actually that Canada's announcement, the very late announcement of 20,000 places for Afghans, which came at the final hour in, in a way that couldn't possibly be fulfilled in the timeless evacuation. I really think that was one of the key sparks for this kind of mass panic where you had tens of thousands of Afghans descending on the airport. I was hearing from people that Canada was going to airlift everyone. So the ways that countries just announce these kind of programs the last minute without any real possibility or plan to actually bring that number of people um, I think is partly responsible for the kind of chaos, panic, and ultimately death and suffering that we've been seeing at the airport. So Matthew Akins with New York Times in Kabul. That last point he made is one we will continue to discuss. Now, Canada's evacuation mission did end just hours before the attacks. Officials say in the past few weeks, Canadian forces have airlifted out more than 3,700 people, but many who had been promised a way out, as you just heard, are being left behind. Stephen D'Souza hears from some tonight who say Canada abandoned them. They waded through sewage and didn't get out. Now some Afghans who hoped Canada would take them see not just soldiers, but an entire country turning its back on them. Now I'm feeling very exhausted. We are in a situation, the words cannot describe it. This devastating news came in an email. Evacuation operations from Afghanistan have now ended. At this time, no further evacuation flights are being planned. Among those left behind, Canadian filmmaker Nargis Osman. She says she's lost confidence in the Canadian government. Their actions have really spoken and they're not able to uh, help us out. And it's very disheartening uh, as a Canadian. When I get there, disheartening too for this contractor who is trying to stay strong for his family. I'm just keeping myself, acting myself as calm as normal. But in my soul, I'm not the same person. Adding to his pain, that devastating attack was at the very spot near the airport that days earlier, many like him were told was their path to freedom. I'm telling uh, our Prime Minister, the Canadian Prime Minister, that you didn't done, you didn't done hundred percent. You were busy with your election or you just ignored us. We stayed in Afghanistan for as long as we could. With the U.S. pulling out in days, Canadian officials said they had no choice. We wish we could have stayed longer and rescued everyone who was so desperate to leave. That we could not is truly heartbreaking. Those remaining now look to the border with Pakistan as one of their few remaining options. There are some, but they are too dangerous, too dangerous to escape from Afghanistan. And just how many are left in this perilous limbo? The government at this point can't say for sure. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Toronto. Now, Kabul may be 10,000 kilometers away from Ottawa, but as David Cochran shows us, the chaos and violence over there is being reflected on right here in the middle of the election campaign. The humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan creating a political crisis in Canada, forcing Justin Trudeau to defend a record that's changing in real time. So where is your personal responsibility for this fiasco? We know 
how incredibly difficult this moment is because Canadians have been working unbelievably hard to get as many people out as we possibly could. Working hard, but too slowly, says the Conservative leader. Mr. Trudeau has wasted months with inaction and has now put us into an election when the situation has been in chaos. As proof, Aaron O'Toole released a letter he wrote to Trudeau on July 22nd, warning, as Afghan interpreters plead for assistance, your government remains silent. But the very next day, July 23rd, the government launched a special immigration program for Afghan interpreters that had been in the works for weeks. The Liberals insist they were on this early, but it wasn't until last week that the first Canadian rescue flight carried people out of Kabul. Canada's efforts did get thousands to safety, but thousands more got left behind. It's sad to say that, that Canada has failed, and Justin Trudeau knew about this problem, knew about the concerns, and didn't act in a timely way. This particular moment is done, and it's heartbreaking to see, but there is much more to do, and Canada will continue to be there uh, for Afghans and the Afghan people. What's missing from all parties are clear answers as to what that looks like. With the U.S. pulling out, there is no realistic military option for Canada. And all parties are refusing to recognize a terrorist organization like the Taliban as a legitimate government, which limits the diplomatic options. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, Afghanistan is just one issue on the minds of voters. CBC News has reporters following the campaigns, which today were focused on economic challenges in this country. Let's start with Tom Perry in Winnipeg with the NDP. Jagmeet Singh focused on housing today. Campaigning in Winnipeg, Singh promised to rein in the skyrocketing price of homes in Canada. He said he would double the first-time homebuyer's credit, make it easier for friends and roommates to pool their cash and buy homes jointly, and impose a 20% tax on foreign buyers. We don't want a Canadian to have to compete with a multinational corporation that looks at the Canadian housing market as an opportunity to make money. That should not be the way things happen, and we're seeing that. Singh also took time to meet with Indigenous leaders. Indigenous voters are a powerful force here in Manitoba, where in this election the NDP is hoping to make gains. I'm Evan Dyer with Conservative leader Erin O'Toole, who said today that if elected, his party will bring in an employee savings account for gig workers who don't have access to employment insurance or the Canada Pension Plan. The gig economy didn't exist years ago when EI and other programs were rolled out and that's why 1.7 million Canadians were missed in a crisis. The O'Toole campaign says the accounts would be portable and would be allowed to grow tax-free but gig employers would also have to contribute. The Canadian Federation of Independent Business is calling the plan worrisome saying it looks like something pulled from a union wish list. I'm Rafi Bujikanian with the Liberal leader in Quebec. Justin Trudeau announced $500 a year in guaranteed income supplements for seniors living alone, $250 more for couples. Unfortunately, we know that for many, many seniors, every dollar counts. And that's been particularly clear during this pandemic, where our seniors have been unbelievably vulnerable. The policy is a response to the Bloc Québécois seen as the Liberals' main rivals in Quebec. For months, Yves-François Blanchet has criticized the Liberals for limiting top-ups to seniors 75 or older. Trudeau has to use his time here efficiently. It's his only day this week campaigning in a province that could be critical in this election. Now, Quebec's premier knows how important his province is in this election, and today he let federal leaders know what Quebec would like. Alison Northcott takes us through it. In this hotly contested Montreal riding, voters have a list of concerns. Affordable housing, especially because now, as you might know, uh, rents are high. We have no uh, doctor. You know, see, it's impossible to, to live in a country like Canada and to have no... Today, as federal parties jostle for support in Quebec, Premier Francois Legault laid out his own list, 11 demands for federal leaders. The first one is about health transfer. I think we have enough bureaucracy. At the top, a no-strings-attached increase in federal health transfers, plus more power to choose which immigrants come into the province. We need to make sure that there's an integration, that people coming 
in Quebec that they learn French. It's a question of survival. I think Legault has a lot of sway with people who voted for Legault. This political columnist says the Premier's top demands align closest to the Conservatives and the blocs, but all the parties are paying attention. Because everybody is very conscious that he's quite popular in uh, a lot of regions in Quebec and they don't want to uh, be in a fight with the popular Premier. Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole was quick to answer Legault, calling his demands clear, legitimate and reasonable. Avec une demande claire. Bloc Québécois leader Yves-François Blanchet said his party would bring all of them to Ottawa, and the Liberals and the NDP say they're ready to work with Quebec. Legault is urging voters to pay attention to how federal leaders respond to his demands and to consider that when they're casting their ballots. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. In Ontario, the pressure is mounting on the government to introduce some form of vaccine passport. Premier Doug Ford has given no indication that he's ready to do that. But as Jayla Bernstein shows us, even one of his core constituencies says they want it. It is a no-brainer. These brothers say they're jealous of vaccine mandates in other provinces. They say a vaccine passport would let their pub keep serving even as cases rise. As far as the hierarchy goes, restaurants, bars, nightclubs, gyms will all be the first to be shut before schools, before anything else. And um, we've just been battered the last 18 months. Both Quebec and British Columbia are rolling out vaccine passports for non-essential venues like bars, restaurants and movie theatres. Manitoba is expected to soon announce its version. So far, Premier Doug Ford has refused to jump on the bandwagon. But the pressure is mounting. Our first and foremost uh, request is really to have a provincial mandate uh, in terms of uh, a mandating vaccines uh, for non-essential places. Ontario's regional medical officers of health are discussing the possibility of creating their own passport system if the province won't step up. We are in the very early exploratory phases of trying to understand uh, what our jurisdiction might be uh, and also the nature of what a program might look like. Much remains uncertain, even as cases and hospitalizations rise and families get ready for back to school. I think we, we, we should start getting like people in, onto that program, like if people want to choose it. Similar to like how, how we have like uh, vaccination cards for the, for the kids and we can slowly like um, ramp it up. This woman says she's tired of the pandemic being politicized. We owe it to frontline workers and we owe it to the restaurant people that are putting their lives on the line. Because every time we actually lock down, you know, they, they lose, you know, their livelihood. That's exactly what the owners of this pub fear. To be the first to fall on the sword again, it's, it's unconscionable for us. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Toronto. Well, CBC News election analysis shows just how much harder it is for diverse candidates to run. Those are realities, you know, people making comments about me being a Muslim. Coming up, the extra hurdles facing people of color on the campaign trail. Plus. Could the chaos and violence at Kabul's airport hurt Trudeau's chances of winning? Rosie and Ad Issue are here. And if you've never heard of line friends, we've got you. A super fan explains the hype and why she stood for hours at the Papa. We're back in two. Welcome back. Federal parties are responding to a CBC News analysis of election candidates. We found that despite efforts to increase representation, more women, more people of color, more indigenous candidates, white male candidates still have distinct advantages. Valerie Willette explains. My suggestion would be we do that, frankly. Door knocking, a rite of passage for every new election candidate. I'm the, I'm the Liberal candidate in the next election. Businessman is. Talib Nur Mohammed is running for the Liberals for a third time, hoping this election will be different. You start with the name, you start with the color of your skin, and those are realities. You know, people making comments about me being a Muslim. So you get you know, very Islamophobic comments. CBC analyzed election data for thousands of past federal candidates. We found that white men ran more often in party strongholds and received more funding from parties than candidates who are racialized or indigenous. In fact, more than 70% of candidates who ran in party strongholds were white men. 
indigenous women faced the toughest odds. Only one out of every eight were elected, compared to one out of every three white men who won their seat. Lori Campbell ran for the NDP in Waterloo in 2019. This election, I'm in it for you. The indigenous two-spirit academic ran to represent her communities, but says she quickly felt let down by her federal party. It kind of felt like um, from federal leadership that it was a bit of a, you know, yeah, you know, they just kind of had decided how it was going to go and, and didn't put in the extra uh, effort for me. Our analysis also found merely having diverse candidates didn't always translate to seats. Take the NDP, the party with the most diverse nominations, at 25 percent. Still, most candidates who won were white. The Liberals had fewer candidates who identified as racialized and indigenous, but more of them became MPs. Meanwhile, almost all the candidates who ran for the Conservatives were white men and women. Just 8 percent of their elected MPs were diverse candidates. I think within all the parties to really like clean up their houses, uh, to really truly um, stand behind and invest in what, uh, you know, what they're saying that they are around diversity. For Talib Nur Mohammed, that change comes one door and one voter at a time. I think when you think about communities that somebody belongs to, right, I'm a tech entrepreneur, so there's that community. I believe in voluntary service. There's a whole voluntary sector to which I am a member of the community. You know, all of those different elements of being part of a community uh, are a big part of, I think, how we frame who we are and how we should frame who we are. So, Valerie, how do the parties respond to the analysis of you and your team? Well, the Bloc Québécois and the Conservatives did not respond, uh, but today Liberal leader Justin Trudeau um, did react. He said his party is committed to increasing candidate diversity, and he also acknowledged that those candidates need more resources so that they can not only represent but also win. Meanwhile, the NDP has made a significant change to its nomination process this election. Every time an incumbent quits or steps down, it is now mandatory for them to be replaced by a diverse candidate. Oh, interesting. Valerie, thank you. Thank you. Well, Toronto's Ryerson University will be getting a new name. It is named after a man considered to be one of the primary architects of the residential school system. The board of directors agreed to change it, but are only expected to announce the new name next year. A correction about a story we brought you last night about a COVID-19 outbreak at a basketball tournament. Leading into the story, we used an image of the Crestwood Preparatory College basketball team. That team did not participate in the tournament. We regret the error. As more Canadians get a chance to reunite, some journeys are filled with grief. We're landing in Nova Scotia for the first time in my life that my father hasn't been there. Coming up, a reunion changed by the loss of a loved one. But first, Rosie is here with At Issue. Hey, Andrew, tonight we're going to talk more about how the crisis in Afghanistan is overshadowing the message on the campaign trail. We have been working day and night over the past months, uh, past weeks uh, and months, uh, to get as many people out as possible. Could this influence how Canadians choose to vote? Chantal, Andrew, Althea, El Amin will join all of us right after the break. As the situation worsens on the ground in Afghanistan, Canada's response continues to overshadow the messaging on the campaign trail here at home, forcing the Liberal leader to answer questions as Prime Minister. We have been working day and night over the past months, uh, past weeks uh, and months, uh, to get as many people out as possible. While the leaders vying for his job are being asked to explain what they would have done differently. We would have gotten people out before the chaos erupted. But like most issues, Mr. Trudeau is late, no leadership. So what kind of political impact does this have on the leaders campaigning? It's Thursday, and I'm here with At Issue, Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj, and Elamine abdul Mahmoud. Good, good to see you all. Um, obviously, the, this situation um, w was unpredictable and, and basically came to a head today with uh, the flights now shutting down and then the violence that has broken out. Uh, what does this mean, uh, if anything, for the Liberals here, Chantal, do you think? And, and how does this play out through the campaign? Or or does it? 
I can't speak about uh, the rest of the campaign, almost a month, but uh, it does hurt the Liberals on two scores. I think uh, uh, it makes the issue of why are we having an election campaign when all this is going on uh, more of an issue than the Liberals should want. But it also, uh, and I go back to the day when the election was called and the danger that there would be a disconnect between the images we would see out of Afghanistan and the prime minister going on his merry way campaigning uh, and promising things that have little to do with Afghanistan. That's happening now, that gap between the campaigner and the reality of office that doesn't look like it's uh, being filled. Uh, Althea, what, what do you make? And uh, the fact, you know, the fact that we also had to leave so many people behind because of how quickly this all unfolded and, and how the situation was managed by the government. Yeah, I mean, I think to Chantez's point, and we've talked about this, it's basically prevented the liberal campaign from taking off because reporters keep asking questions about Afghanistan and, and rightfully asking questions about Afghanistan and not about the liberals' announcement of the day. I think the risk is um, if we start seeing images that really directly connect uh, the government's actions to the crisis. So if Afghan interpreters start getting murdered, if people with Canadian papers um, just, you know, are found dead on the streets, I mean, that is really going to bring that home. And that could be the Alan Curdy moment of the 2021 election campaign and worse, actually. But I think on this issue, frankly, none of the opposition parties have a good answer either. I mean, for all of their complaints that, you know, I would have led and I would have done things differently, when you actually look at the facts, nobody was really talking about this issue. The government did not do anything, and the Liberals could have brought in more Afghan interpreters earlier. But if you look at the record in the House of Commons, the last time anybody asked about this was in 2011, and it was Liberal MP Dominic LeBlanc wondering why the Conservatives were rejecting two-thirds of the Afghan appeals. And at that time, Jason Kenney, who was responsible for the government, responded that, no, Canada had never made any promises to these people. So frankly, none of the opposition parties have a good record on this issue. OK, Andrew, how about you? How do you think it's being managed? Well, that's as may be, but the government of the day is the government of the day, and it is the one that has responsibility for dealing with the situation that it finds. Uh, mm -hmm. The collapse ha happened um, some days or weeks sooner than people anticipated, but everyone knew it was coming, has known it for months, has known it for years. So this is not just a matter of optics but that's not or true. politics. I'm sorry, it is. I, okay. I have talked to people who have been involved it's, in this file yeah. very closely. Yeah. Uh, and they are quite clear in saying that this was absolutely foreseeable. It was foreseen. It was it, people knew. So uh, it's not just a matter of optics or politics. It's a matter that we've left behind thousands of people, including Canadian citizens, it appears, uh, mm -hmm. who are facing a very uncertain fate now. And whether or not the opposition parties would have done better or not, we can that, that can be debated. But what uh, is certainly worth pointing out is is holding the government of the day to account on that. Wait, both Maybe not like, years. Yeah, yeah. Hang on, hang, like, hang on one second. Okay. I'll just let Andrew. Uh, Andrew and I just are going to quickly disclose uh, two things around this situation. Andrew, I'll go to you first. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, my partner and I were involved in an effort to get some people out. We were successful, as it turned out, but we were among the fortunate few. And the other people that I have talked to who have been trying have met uh, a uniform wall of difficulty and indifference and opaque communications and everything beyond that. And, I, and I'll also just add that multiple news organizations, including this one, the, the CBC, also were working to get people out, people that were supporting our journalists during uh, the conflict. Um, and again, varying degrees of success there, just as Andrew said. Elamine, sorry. Uh, the point that Andrew is making, I don't think it's true that people have been knowing that this is going to come for years, but certainly it's been months, uh, certainly like since maybe April or May, uh, and certainly since uh, Biden announced that the U.S. is going to pull out. You would expect that Canada would have mobilized to move a little bit faster on this, and they did not. And like that is something that is going to hang um, around Trudeau's neck this entire time. He keeps getting the question, how are you managing Afghanistan? And he keeps having to answer by saying, I'm campaigning just fine while managing that. Well, now it looks worse. It's going to continue to look worse. Um, but it's something that is in his favor, is that it is very early on in this campaign. And, like, we could be somewhere else um, yeah. two, three weeks from now. We could be talking about the Delta variant and not even remembering talking about Afghanistan. Um, but uh, as of right now, it's just a story that keeps coming back every day, right? Okay, I, 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 I do want to do a round on health care if I can, but just because it was a dominant uh, 
theme already this week. And then today, the Quebec Premier, François Legault, shared his list of priorities for the federal parties. And one of them was, yes, obviously, a health care transfer boost, but also, please stay out of my business, is basically what he said. I'll, I, I'll support parties that say that they're going to do that. Chantal, how do you read what the Premier said and how much health care is or will become an issue through this? Whether it's an issue uh, with voters remains to be seen. For sure, premiers are going to say, because that's been their position for a year and a half, that they want an increase in the transfer and not necessarily conditions and strings attached. I think the liberals look weak on this uh, as they are in attack mode because they seem to be over the years, and I've covered federal campaigns for too long now, probably, <laughs> so I've seen this movie again and again. The liberals are never more interested in the integrity, quote unquote, of the Medicare system than when they're campaigning for re-election. Okay. And the rest of the time, you rarely hear about it. Andrew? Yeah, the liberals are shocked, shocked to discover that there are private clinics operating. Uh, they're particularly exercised about them in Saskatchewan, uh, less so in Quebec. Uh, mm -hmm. So it is a, a bit corny. Uh, I think, we, as Chantel said, we've seen this movie before. Uh, we've also seen the premiers uh, cr cr crying poor about health care for many, many years. Uh, but that should not obscure that, in fact, you know, as I often say, the, the story of the boy who cries wolf ends with the wolf devouring the boy. Um, <laughs> we actually do have a health care funding crisis coming upon us because of the aging of the population. Okay. But what has to, the discussion that has to begin is not just this annual thing of giving the provinces money, no strings attached, which therefore means no accountability either for it, but giving them the taxing powers to raise the funds themselves and be accountable to their own citizens for the results. So we've got to get out of this two-way blame game where, in the end, neither level of government gets properly held to account for the results. Uh, last word to Elamine. Althea, I'll start with you on the next round. I just really appreciated that you called it a list of priorities and not a grocery list, because there's something about <laughs> Legault's approach to just saying, you know what, there are many things that I'm asking for. And the, I mean, yes, it is about healthcare, but also this is about autonomy. And I think the idea of Legault feeling emboldened by his popularity to um, basically dictate his terms, uh, that's going to be an interesting dynamic to watch. I was waiting for this to pop up. I thought it would pop up a little bit later on in the campaign, but here it is. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Um, uh, I should point out that Andrew's dog really wanted to talk about health care, too. You probably didn't know Andrew <laughs> made an appearance just in the back. It was lovely and nice, refreshing to see. Okay, we'll be back with another round of At Issue. Althea will start us off on this question. Take a look. Do you stand by your party's previous position that you would never prop up a conservative minority? Okay, the NDP leader's response to that and the strategies during this week two of the campaign. That's coming up. In a new Democrat government as prime minister, whether it's a majority or a minority, we'll uh, look at that when it happens and make decisions that are in the best interest of Canadians. The NDP leader there leaving the door open to working with all parties, including the Conservatives, after he was asked this week whether his party would prop up a minority Conservative government, something that hasn't happened yet, but there it is, it's on the table. And we're pointing this out because Jagmeet Singh he said he would not do that in back in 2019. So what's behind the change? Chantal, Andrew, Althea, and Elamine back for another round. Althea, I said I'd start with you, so tell me what you made of that answer and, and what we should make of it. I think the New Democrats um, around Jagmeet think that Aaron O'Toole is more palatable than Andrew Scheer. But more importantly, though, I would say that they want to keep their powder dry. If they find themselves in a situation where either the Conservatives or the Liberals can form government, ruling out voting or siding with the Conservatives basically means that they have no demands that they can place on the Liberals. And so it is strategically wiser for them uh, to hold out that card so that they can extract any concessions from the grids. Chantal? But there is a risk to that. Uh, you can either think that they have made the Aaron O'Toole less scary uh, by saying that, or else that they have made a lot of uh, swing NDP liberal voters realize that there is a possibility that the Conservatives will win the election. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of voters on the left side of the spectrum have been operating under the assumption that their choice on September 20th was a minority or a majority liberal government. Now mm -hmm. they are being told in rather stark terms that their choice may be between a conservative yeah. and a liberal government. I can't tell you 
where uh, the vote goes from there, but it is a risky move. Uh, Elamine, your thoughts on that and, and what you all seem to agree on last week was that the Liberals were off to a, a slow start. I mean, certainly it indicates um, on part of Jagmeet Singh that he wants to play ball this election. He's trying to increase his seat count. He's not trying to look like the guy who will just willing to prop up the Liberals at any cost. And you know what? That's a strong signal to, sh to, to, to send. But at the same time, like Chantal said, it does kind of have the inverse problem, which is that mm -hmm. the Liberals can now go on the attack. I don't know when. I'm guessing that the Liberals will put this on the shelf, come back to it after, la after yeah. Labor Day, and say, listen, the NDP are willing to work with the Conservatives. Now we are your only real choice. And we, there's a lot of hand-wringing um, among progressives in terms of saying, no, don't make us, don't frame the choice like this. But in the end, they end up going back to the Liberal camp. So it might be something that is kind of dangerous for the, for the NDP. And is there, no, is there no world in which the NDP could extract things from a conservative minority government, Andrew? Is that just not a thing? Well, of course they could. Of yeah. course they could. Yeah. Uh, if, the Tory, if this was the price of the Tories staying in power, they'd pay it. Uh, so, no, I, I think the Tories and the NDP are objective allies. The Tories need the NDP to do well, to cut votes away from the Liberals. Yeah. And the, the NDP, I think, as job one, needs to prevent the Liberals from doing the play they always do every election, which is demonizing the Tories and telling new Democrat waverers, you have to vote Liberal to stop the Tories, because all, you know, the floods will rise and, and, you know, winged monkeys will fly over the earth if the Tories get in. I see Chantal has things to say. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, if you believe, as the NDP has worked uh, on for years about uh, the ten dollars a day child care yeah. is more important than tax credits that's also in the balance and i suspect many in the indigenous leadership do not believe that the the ndp can have the conservatives uh on the same track as the liberals on the issue La last thought to you elamine i have yeah. 10 seconds I mean, I do have to say that uh, all credit here goes to Aaron O'Toole for making himself a different enough leader of the Conservatives that this is even on the table. I mean, like, this would just was just not on the table two years ago, so I have to imagine that uh, they're feeling pretty good about that one. Okay, Toby the dog wants us to finish, so that's what we will do. <laughs> Thank you, Chantal, Andrew, Althea, and Olivine. We'll see you next week. Thanks. Okay, and Rosie, what are you working ahead on for this Sunday's uh, Rosemary Barton Live? We are going to talk more about Afghanistan, obviously, on, on the show, too, particularly what is going to happen now to the many thousands of people who were left back, who Canada didn't manage to get out, and, and the efforts that will be made to try and get them out. And we're also going to talk uh, about health care, because that has become one of those dominant issues so far in this campaign. And we'll talk to the parties about who they think has the best plan going forward. Okay. Thanks, Rosie. Thanks. As travel opens up, many are able to reunite with their loved ones, but sometimes those journeys are bittersweet. Two months after our son came into the world, uh, my father passed away. Coming up, one family travels east to say goodbye. We're back in two. And he's going to get past him, and that is the race. A phenomenal performance. Well, Canada's Tristan Chernoff won silver in the men's C1 3,000 meter individual pursuit. It is the 46 year old's fourth Paralympic medal, and it wasn't Canada's only medal on day two of the Games. Glides to the wall and still smashes it by half a second almost. Turbide manages to upgrade a bronze previously to a very fine silver for Canada. Quebec's Nicolas Guy Turbide brought home another silver with an impressive race in the men's S13 100 meter backstroke final. This is the 24 year old second Paralympic appearance. Well, tonight we are continuing a series here on The National about pandemic reunions, something the Rockwells have been waiting for for a very long time. Now, after welcoming their second child into the world at the height of COVID, they share their new joy with family and grieve the death of one who didn't get the chance. We're really looking forward to just giving somebody a proper hug again. I don't think I've so much as shaken another person's hand for 16 months now. On the airplane. On the way to Grandma's house. Jasper, we made it. I suspect that, that this will be kind of an emotional visit and I expect it to be very apparent that we're landing in Nova Scotia for the first time in my life that my father hasn't been there.
I'm Andrew Rockwell. I'm originally from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, but I live in Calgary. And I'm Kimberly Rockwell. I'm originally from Ontario. For us, this pandemic has been especially challenging. Our son Jasper was born uh, right at the height of the first peak. We're used to living in Calgary uh, on our own, uh, but we're also used to traveling back and forth to the East Coast or having people come to visit us every couple of months. We certainly never thought that we would go, you know, 16 months with a newborn baby without having family and friends to, to help us out. Happy birthday to you. They kind of say like it takes a village to raise a child and then during the pandemic your village is like virtual. It's been quite difficult seeing our children grow up and change knowing that our parents window to that is is a computer screen. And realizing that our little boy Jasper uh, only ever got to meet his papa uh, through video call. Never, never got to to uh, be helped by him. Two months after our son came into the world, uh, my father passed away in Nova Scotia of, of a heart attack un unexpectedly. The initial reaction is, I need to hop on a plane and, and fly back to be there. It didn't take long to realize that the reality of the situation was that we were still learning more about the disease. It was still clear that travel wasn't recommended. We knew that we would not be able to have a funeral service. And you would have either needed to isolate for 14 days alone, or like we would have all had to have flown there as a family and isolated. It just wasn't a, a practical solution. It's been a year and Kind of as I was saying, we haven't really had the opportunity to like experience the emotions that come with, with, with losing somebody. It's just been such an odd experience going through that without the people I expected to go through that emotional journey with. I'm really looking forward to finally being able to formally lay my dad to rest telling stories about his life, about all the times that he made us laugh or that he did wonderful things for us. And just seeing my mom playing with our kids and, and hearing them interact. Are you guys eating strawberries with your Nana? I'm also looking forward to being able to have our parents look after our kids for a night. We, we haven't had time to ourselves. We haven't been able to go on a date um, in 16 months dinner together, maybe having a glass of wine, going out for, for ice cream. Simple things that before the pandemic we might have taken for granted. A lot of love in that family. Up next, as K-pop music gets more popular, the fans get more invested. My friends and I decided to go down at midnight last night. <laughs> One super fan story, how she stood in line all night for a K-pop pop-up shop. Our moment is next. So there is a chance people near Toronto saw this massive line at a mall and wondered, what is that? Well, it turns out those were hundreds of super fans of the Korean pop band BTS. And they had some shopping to do. So one pop-up store, a collaboration between a Korean company called Line Friends and BTS, the fans, could not believe their luck. And a super fan tells us why. She's our moment. Uh, Line Friends and BTS, the K-pop band, made a creation called BT21 together. That was their collaboration. Light it up, like dynamite, whoa, whoa. And they made this line of um, characters and toys. Well, this morning was their opening launch. So my friends and I decided to go down at midnight last night. <laughs> we just kind of like sat in the parking lot until uh, this morning when they opened the doors. And the shop is just adorable. It's so cute. Obviously, I think they know that that's where the draw really is, are the BTS fans. You can see it every time that they have these pop-ups. They just sell out crazy. Even me leaving, I was like, oh my God, there's people like in the parking lot. It's like wrapping around. But I did end up buying like at least over like $200 worth of stuff. It was crazy, but I mean, it's not even the first time I've done this. So I'm not even like surprised. 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I, which was your favorite line friend character again? You were, oh, you, I, you know what? Uh, there are just so many of them. Uh, <laughs> too many to but you know what I want for Christmas now. <laughs> One of those things. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I will admit there's a part of me that wonders why can't you just order them online? Why do you have to wait so long? But I guess experience. if it was the launch, the experience. And I'm the... telling you, had the Bay City Rollers had a pop-up store, <laughs> that would have been me. That, that would have been your jam. Yeah. <laughs> that is a national for August 26th. Good night. Good night.